Last week we started chapter 30 of Isaiah. And because of all y'all's chasing rabbits, um, we only got through one verse. We all laughing at. <clears throat> but <laughs> no, we probably haven't caught them all. I'm sure of that. But the first seven verses of this chapter deals with the the alliance with Egypt. It's a recurring theme through Isaiah, actually. Um, But he tells them, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Uh, To God... (coughs) God had stated what to do with rebellious children. Deuteronomy 21 uh, shows that they were to put them to death. Same word, in fact, uh, dealing with rebellious children in Deuteronomy as it is here in Isaiah 30 and verse 1. Uh, Well, Judah was acting like rebellious children. Uh, They had avenues of asking God for His wisdom and His decisions, but they refused. And so they were covering with a covering. Uh, Our American standard says a league, and New King James, I think, has devising plans. Uh, So it extended not just to uh, <coughs> to the aspect of uh, their making the plans, but they go ahead and start implementing those plans uh, in making a covenant with Egypt. Uh, and we see that in verse 2, that which is where we're going to start tonight. Uh, That walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. The way this is worded is that an ambassador has already started or has he is anticipation of starting a journey to Egypt. It's not specifically stated in the books of history that Hezekiah made an appeal to Egypt to help against Assyria. However, we would be made to wonder when... Rabshakeh, who is, and that's just a title probably like to a general that we would have. Uh, if you look at 2 Kings 18, he is speaking to the Israelites. And if you look in verse 21, He states, why are now, behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and all that trust him, or trust on him. If you look down a few verses in verse 24, he adds this. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Why would he be stating this if Hezekiah has not done it? Uh, He doesn't mention other nations 
as far as uh, they're putting their trust in other nations, but he does in relationship to Egypt. So, the idea is they have made their decision. They're going to Egypt to ask for help. But they're not asking for God's help. Uh, now then, they should have been asking at, as he puts it here, at my mouth. At God's mouth. Let's look at a few verses. In first Numbers 27 and verse 21, if somebody wants to turn over there. Numbers 27 and verse 21. Okay. <coughs> Numbers twenty-seven twenty-one could ask counsel from God after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. So that was another way I mentioned last week they could have asked the prophets. The prophets were God's spokesmen. Here's another method of asking of God's wisdom, God's counsel, going before uh, or asking judgment of the Urim. Uh, somebody read Judges chapter 1 and verse 1. Because now then we're going to see some illustrations of them doing this very thing and asking at God's mouth. Judges 1 verse 1. So now then, <coughs> they are seeking God's counsel, asking him who should go up to fight uh, the Canaanites first, uh, first ones of the tribes of Israel. Uh, turn over to Judges chapter 20 and verse 18. Okay, again, who should go up first to battle? And God tells them specifically. Um, Judah is the first one to go up. Uh, turn over to 1 Samuel 23 and verse 2. Okay, David asked, you know, this is going against, should I even go against the Philistines? Should I attack them? And God's response is, yes, go attack them. Go fight against them. Um, look at 1 Samuel 22 and verse 7. 1 Kings 22, 7. Is 
in this situation, this is what we are going to see. Micaiah is the prophet of the Lord. But here's all of these prophets, false prophets, saying, yes, go up to battle and win the war. You'll drive these uh, people out. And Jehoshaphat asked, isn't there one prophet of the Lord around here? <laughs> Basically. And he said, yeah, there's one more, but he hates me. He always prophesies evil against me. And Micaiah is told on the way after he's gotten, speak well, say things that are nice. But instead he says, whatever the Lord says, that's what I'm going to say. But there was the principle that they, they've seen all through this time. You ask God. Take counsel from Him. Uh, but they're instead going to Egypt. Well, that would be their own understanding. This is man's understanding. But yes, the, there's the need to trust in the Lord. That's the whole principle. Uh, that they now fail to recognize and to accept. <clears throat> Ask at my mouth is basically to consult the prophets. They failed in doing so. When they failed to ask counsel of God, it resulted in their failure. Someone read Joshua chapter 9 and verse 14. Joshua 9 and verse 14. This is <coughs> a nation saw Israel coming into the land, they ta are taking the land, and so they devise a plan. We're going to look like we've traveled a long, long ways. We are a nation far away from here, and we want to make a league with you, a pact with you. And basically, instead of asking from God about the situation, they just accept what those men had said. And as a result, they made an agreement with them when they lived in the land. And it was an agreement that uh, they would protect each other and fight for e with each other. And so it led to their downfall. Um, and they had even, it's interesting, they had even questioned these men. You might live among us. You might live in this area. Why should we make a league with you? No, we live a long ways away. What were they doing? Deceiving? Lying. That's the word I was thinking of. They were just simply lying to them. Why do we think that people who live in error, who are not religious any at all, or who not, do not follow God's word, why do they, we think that they are somehow going to tell us the truth? These people didn't. Even when questioned diligently, you know, you might live among us and we can't make a league with you. Oh, but we, we didn't look at our food, it's moldy, and look at our clothes, it's, they're worn out because we come from such a long ways away. And all of it was lies. Well, that was the whole thing. They were supposed to purge the whole land. And 
because of this, they were not able to. Because of this agreement, they were not able to drive those people from them. Um, and so that's what happens, though, when we don't go to God in His will. Now, we can't ask the prophets today like they could, but what can we do? Okay, we have God's Word that we can appeal to. Okay, that's a good passage along that line. Prove all things. That's put it to the test. Make sure that there's the proper evidence that it can be given. Um, yes and no. Yes, in a sense that they did not drive out the nations. Uh, there were several nations that were not driven out like God intended for it to be. And so God basically says, I'm leaving them there to put you to the test, to see whether you'll be faithful to me. And so by failing to drive them out, they soon... Well, maybe not soon, but after a while. <coughs> after a while, they started taking on and worshiping the gods of those nations. So it didn't happen immediately, but over a period of many years or even centuries, uh, that does, it did lead to that, yes. Uh, you can't allow, cannot allow sin to remain in the camp uh, without it having its effect. Right. Yes, yeah, again, they, they were told very specifically, do not marry those of other nations. Uh, and we see that they did after a while. Thus, uh, the influence of wives and husbands uh, in that, those marriages. Uh, well, like Jezebel, uh, what about Samson's wife, Delilah? Uh, and you could go on, there's several illustrations always led to their downfall. Uh, failing to ask of God and follow God's precepts always leads and results in problems or difficulties. Uh, but in Israel at this time, when it says that they're going down into Egypt, they've not asked at my mouth, it basically says they've ignored his prophets. Uh, ignoring what Isaiah says, for one. There's a lot said throughout the prophets about that same thing. Uh, they just simply refused to hear the prophets who were speaking in God's name. Uh, they strengthened themselves in the strength of Pharaoh. Uh, instead of strengthening themselves in God and his strength, they trusted Pharaoh and his strength. Uh, guess which one was more powerful? Do we even need to answer that, really? But uh, obviously, God was more powerful. Which one could have given them protection? Pharaoh or God? Which one could have driven the Assyrian nation out of Judah? Pharaoh or God? And yet, 
they're going to trust in the strength of Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh's just a man. Couldn't do much of anything, really. And as Rab Shekha said, he's a broken reed uh, that will pierce your hand. In other words, he doesn't have any strength to stop Assyria. And he didn't. Bill? I know they were told specifically not to go to Egypt um, and return there for chariots and things. I'm not positive that it states chariots specifically. Um, it does say horses. Um, so, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, Well, that was Rabshakeh. Uh, the, the, yeah, that, and that's what Rabshakeh was saying. You're going to go to Egypt and trust in that broken reed that will pierce your hand. Uh, and if, if he should give you horses or chariots, you can't stop even one part of my master's uh, army. Uh, can't do anything. <coughs> to trust in the shadow of Egypt. The shadow of Egypt. Let me change that for a second to the shadow of God. Because the shadow of God was really a familiar phrase to the Jews. Uh, let's just read a few verses. Uh, someone turn over to Psalm 17 and verse 8. Okay, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. The request to God. A few chapters later, uh, Psalm 36 and verse 7. That's not what I have down. <laughs> 37 or 36 and verse 7. Okay. God's loving kindness. And so what do they do? They put their trust under the shadow of God's wings. Mm, yes, some of the songs have that. Uh, you see it in Psalm 30, 63 and verse 7. Uh, notice specifically it's tied in with help here. God's help. What is it? Therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. What is it? His help. The help that he's giving. And so he is able to rejoice. Why? Because of the shadow of God's wings. Uh, look at Psalm 91 and verse 1. dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. And what is it? 
He's abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Isaiah uses this phrase or this idea or figure as well. Uh, turn back to Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 4. Okay, that one has a shade. King James has a shadow from the heat. Um, that's no King James a shade. Um, so a shade, a shadow. The shadow of God's wings. Well, a shadow from the heat. Uh, and that's, he's describing God. Thou hast been a strength to the poor. Thou hast been a strength to the needy in his distress. God has been a refuge from the storm. God has been a shadow or shade from the heat. Uh, you see the same idea in Isaiah 32 and verse 2. shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Um, again, a great place in which is a place of safety. But it's using that expression of a shadow. Well, here the shadow of Egypt instead of the shadow of God. Um, it's an expression of looking for protection, for care, uh, for being a refuge, a great rock in a weary land. All of those type of expressions. <coughs> and they were looking to Egypt to be that instead of to God. Pharaoh had promised a great deal, but he pr provided very little. He was not able to carry through with what all he said. Carl? How long was this after the Exodus? After the Exodus? Oh, me. Uh, the, let's say just uh, because I'm not doing the actual figuring, but uh, 700 years. Uh, probably closer to 800. Uh, the Exodus would have been around, well, Moses was around 1500 B.C. Uh, Isaiah was written 700, thereabouts. So... That gives you a time frame. Uh, and that's not exact, understand, but... Uh, <laughs> well, long enough to be forgotten. It doesn't take a uh, man but a few years to forget. Uh, the... If you will recall in uh, Joshua, you have, or actually Judges, the first, the second chapter, you have the death of Joshua. And then it says there arose another generation who forgot the Lord. So from the time of Joshua's death to another generation, that's not very long. 
It doesn't take long. Uh, I think I, it was Gary Summers that I heard preach a sermon in a, a lectureship years ago dealing with the third generation. Uh, you basically have one generation that's very faithful to God and relies upon God. The second, their children, well, not so much so. There's a slow weakening. But the third generation, you generally see an apostasy in that generation. Uh, and now, obviously, that's not every time. Obviously not. But it is a, an habitual occurrence uh, where you have that type of a situation in the third generation. Uh, that's really all you have to do the 1950s to now. Um, and I'll just add my personal opinion <laughs> is that in the 1950s when we experienced such rapid growth a lot of times we baptized people but we never got the denominationalism out of them You think not? You think they didn't have those books back in the 1950s? I can show you book after book after book. What good does a book do if you don't use it all? I'm just. <laughs> it doesn't take long. And. But 1950s to now, uh, you certainly see how long it takes. Actually, you could probably look from the 1950s to the 1960s and you start seeing it there uh, with a lot of congregations even then. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Get. And that was the problem in so many cases. They still had the denominationalism stuck in them. And after a while, when that older generation died off, they started taking over and becoming the leaders. And they didn't have the foundation and the grounding that the former generation had. So it doesn't take long. Um, but Pharaoh promised a great deal, delivered nothing. Um, also, we are, of course, reminded that Israel at one time had been under the shadow of Egypt. When they were in bondage in Egypt, uh, Egypt oppressed Israel, but they were also under the protection of Egypt. Uh, they were slaves of Egypt. Uh, <clears throat> from that oppression, God delivered Israel and then gave her the warning that we see in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 16. It says, but he, <coughs> but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord saith unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. What were they doing now? Exactly what God says do not do. Uh, well, 
Deuteronomy inside uh, the temple under some dusty covered place in, in, the, in the branches on our bodies. Well, they left they left the precepts many years before that, and then they lost the book, yes, and it was found in the temple. Um, Marion Fox uh, wrote this concerning uh, this time frame. In 720 B.C., the Ethiopian king, Shabako, conquered Egypt and set up the 22nd dynasty. He sent ambassadors to incite the nations of Palestine to revolt against the Assyrian rule. Hezekiah followed the lead of his father Ahaz in thinking that alliances with other nations could serve the purpose of Israel in their rebellion against an oppressor. They sought to be strengthened by Pharaoh, verse 2, who sent ambassadors to make a league with the nations of Palestine, verse 4. Uh, Judah was drawn into this league by promises of military aid from Egypt. Uh, and so you have that contemporary event in Egypt. Here's Shabako. Uh, in 720, who has conquered Egypt and set up that 22nd dynasty. He sends out ambassadors to all these nations. You need to rebel against Assyria. So what do some of them do? They start rebelling against Assyria. Now then, to rebel against a nation, all you had to do basically was stop paying taxes to them, or tribute. And so when they send uh, someone down to get some tribute, no, I'm going to do it. So what happens? The nation comes down and makes war with them and takes it. Uh, but now then, Egypt is sending out these ambassadors saying, you know, rebel against Assyria, we'll give you protection. And they couldn't. They didn't have the power to. Uh, so in verse 3, Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust of the shadow of Egypt your confusion. <coughs> Judah's plans... And getting help from Egypt is going to fail. Instead of finding strength and protection, all they're going to find is shame, confusion. Uh, New King James has humiliation. The shame of sin and guilt added to the aspect of embarrassment of failure. It leads to confusion or emptiness and waste instead of protection. <clears throat> While it is not stated why this result, the probability is that Egypt was simply unable to provide such. And of course Judah needed to rely on God's help. <clears throat> we'll end with maybe a few comments about all that they find is shame and embarrassment or confusion, humiliation. That's what sin brings. Shame, humiliation, confusion... And yet, in our, in our times, I won't say our society because it's worldwide, people relish in their shame and disgrace. There is, we live in a time in which 
people are amoral. The A prefix is a negation, so it's not moral. People have no morals today. They live according to their own will. They have no shame. Okay, they do what's right in their own eyes. I know if we ask us, those here, for example, we would all recognize Playboy as pornographic, right? I don't think there's anyone who would disagree with that. Not here. Go out on the street and start asking people. You might be surprised at the, what you would find because they don't believe that it is. Why? Because they have no shame. They have no guidance from a moral standpoint. And why should they? They're taught that they're nothing but an animal. Uh, in fact, as one book uh, had the title, The Hairless Animal, because we don't have a bunch of hair on our body like the apes do. And so the hairless animal, man, but all he is is an animal. Well, if he's nothing but an animal, why shouldn't he act like an animal? Um, that which should produce shame in people just simply does not do it. They glory today in that shame. They revel in it. It's something glorious. Uh, some of the things that take place today in our, in our nation, you can't even speak of them because of the vileness of it. It's that bad. Um, And, you know, as a preacher sometimes, how can you even describe these things? How can you talk about them? Because it is so vile that propriety does not even allow you to speak of it. <laughs> and yet, it's out in the open. And people are proud of it. Uh, that's what we're fighting within our world today. And as I say, the world, it's not just the United States, it's worldwide. We'll stop there, and next week we'll start with verse 4. Lord willing. <laughs>